How are you today? I am good. How are you? I'm excellent. You know why? Why is that? It's time for Jerry and J-Rob. Cover it all. Favorite show. <laughs> that's, that's right. All 25 yeah, of all. whoever you are else out there. Uh, well, I'm pretty excited about uh, about today. As am I. Uh, we have a, a special guest today who has been a great friend of mine and a tremendous help to our family, uh, Dr. David Carmack. Hey, Doc. Hey. How's it going, Jerry? Welcome, Good. welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. You bet. My pleasure. Yeah. So how do you know this guy? You said he's a family doctor. Well, uh, when, when my wife had her accident, she had emergency surgery on, uh, on both of her feet in Cedar Park. But after that, uh, we needed a, a doctor and she had more problems. And so that's how we got into contact with Doc here. And he's performed several surgeries on her since then. Uh, but more than, more than just that physical side, he's been a, a, a great encouragement uh, to us during our some of our roughest times that we've we've gone through and so that's why um, you know I, I, I doc I truly appreciate your friendship and, and everything you've done you guys um, have encouraged me a lot of times in the office too you know sometimes you get bogged down and the right person comes in and says the right thing and you get back on track and that's all how it's always been with your family sure that's what friends are for right yeah <laughs> very good well I think that's extremely imperative is, is having a good relationship with your doctor i know you know we're 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 all a sickly bunch around here we got lots of doctors and very few do we do we actually have a good relationship where you know you can actually call this guy or that girl and mm -hmm. and talk about what's going on and so on and so forth so tell us about yourself what, what where do you work at what do you do what's your specialty uh i'm my name is david carmack and i currently live out here in Burnett, out in the country um i'm married uh have three children my wife just had a baby, my first son. Congratulations. And, um, thank you. And uh, He's a roly-poly little guy, too. Yes, he is. He's a, <laughs> he's a beefcake, for sure. He, he, he's well-fed. Um, I'm in private practice. I'm a podiatrist, so uh, I treat foot and ankle issues. I'm board-certified in reconstructive foot and ankle surgery. Do a lot of diabetic limb salvage for people with diabetic complications. And um, I've been practicing for 16 years, but... That plus residency got about 20 years of, of medical experience, and uh, this is my first launch out into the deep going into private practice in the year 2022, which has proven very challenging considering the radical increase in cost of living and right. you know, insurance reimbursements down and things like that. So it's been a challenge, but it's also been a blessing in many ways, and I'm still walking through that. that you know, I'm not a great businessman. Most doctors are not great businessmen. Um, so I'm learning the ropes, and. Uh, you know, the old-fashioned way, the, the hard way, but right. it's coming along. So. So, so you mean the insurance company doesn't pay you the same day and give you the full amount that you no. have charged? No, sadly, sometimes <laughs> it's it's a pretty big battle to get, yeah, to get reimbursed they're on not, some things. So. They're not in business on accident. They're, uh, they'll are they take advantage of either side. It doesn't yeah. bother them. So, well, well done. You started something pretty amazing with, you know, going out on your own yeah. and doing your own thing. It is a trivial time. It's hard to make things happen. Business right. is hard. I, I'm, I'm a business guy. I get it. Uh, totally understand that yeah. um, but you worked on this guy's wife and that's how you came to know him so you have known right. each other how long uh yeah at least uh what six years I'd say somewhere in there -ish. yeah 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 she had her accident in uh the end of 2015 and so it would have been 2016 mm -hmm. when you started working on her yep. and she is going to be having another surgery coming up it's just the way um, you know, her body is with the lupus and, and other autoimmune issues that she has tend to um, eat at her tendons and, and cause all kinds of problems. And fortunately, Doc has been able to, to keep her going. And, yeah. and so we appreciate that. Uh, but tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, our, our show is, is geared toward stories of overcoming, of positivity, yeah. of getting through uh, tough circumstances to mm -hmm. rise above and sure. be the leaders that we were created to be. Right. And I know that in our, our visiting, you've 
you've kind of shared with me a little bit about uh, you know your struggles in, in your younger years oh, and yeah. uh, how you you overcame that and and different things. So so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll, g- I'll give you a little background history. Um, I was born in uh, northern Nevada, a little town called Elko on the Idaho Utah border, out in the country. No siblings, no neighbors. Um, it was a great lifestyle, but kind of a lonely lifestyle. My dad. A salt of the earth guy from Oklahoma, born in 1937 on a farm, um, had eight brothers and sisters, the whole Grapes of Wrath thing where by the time the (laughs) 1940s hit, they were barely making it. He quit school in seventh grade. They packed everything up, got on a truck, drove to California to start picking cotton and make, that's where the dreams were, California back then. And he was raised uh, the old American way where it was about hard work, good ethic. you know, holding the door open for the little old lady, looking at someone in their eye and, and shaking their hand firmly, your yes is yes, your no is no. But he wasn't raised in the church. So, you know, he, he instilled a lot of those great American ideals in me, but he also imparted in me the spirit of atheism at a young age. Now, my mom, who was many years younger, um, she was raised as a Roman Catholic, and fortunately, she took it upon herself to take me to church off and on throughout those years. And she did the best that she could. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really stick. And I, and I, I attribute that really to the fact that my dad would say things like, you're going to get up and go to church with your mother so she won't whine at me. And then when I would ask him if he was coming, he'd say, why would I come? That's a, you know, that's a waste of time. And so there was some conflicting information coming there. And when I was a teenager, um, you know, I, I, for the most part, I was a good kid, but like all kids, I had to test things out and, and, and get into a little bit of trouble. And I do remember my mom uh, saying to me, you know, along the way, we need to pray. She taught me how to get on my hands and knees and pray. And I walked through those different experiences, which later would, would prove to be very, very important. And so by the time I graduated high school, I would say I was a lukewarm believer at best. Um, and but I was interested in this idea of religion and I wanted to know more about it. And so I left this small little kind of cookie cutter country town and went to the big city to college. And I, the first class, one of the first elective classes I took was called theory of religion, thinking that maybe they would begin to sow a foundation of, of, of a religious ideology in me. Nobody warned me that um, when I left the small town and went to the big city, that all of the professors were fully committed and geared to smashing any kind of biblical ideology that you possibly yeah. had. And so by the time I, I left that first semester course, I called up my parents and told my dad, you're right, there is no God. Sorry, mom, but I'm with dad, I'm an atheist. And then I rode that out for another 15 years. And so you can imagine, um, you know, like it says in Ephesians 2, sort of walking with the principalities of the world, you know, according to that spirit of disobedience. Uh Um, I didn't have any ill will towards anybody, but this idea of sin didn't exist. I was my own master. I was my own God. I made up my own playbook, and I lived according to whatever ways that I wanted. And so that involved, you know, all the typical nightlife activities that come with college and, you know, fast fast living and fast friends. And um, I did that for a long time, and then... uh, when I got into my 30s, um, for whatever reason, that wasn't working anymore. And so um, I met my wife at the time, who was also an unbeliever. And we were sort of walking that path out together. And although things were starting to fall in place from a worldly perspective, at this point now I was a doctor and I was making decent money, um, acquiring all the stuff and the things that, you know, the American dream, so to speak, trying to get ahead. Of course, you're not really sure what you're trying to get ahead of, but you're just trying to make sure you put enough away to get ahead. And at that point, I would definitely say that uh, the spirit of greed had probably become my God at that point. It was all about, there was no almighty God. It was just about the almighty dollar and how much I could do for me and mine. And so even though I was accruing wealth on a certain degree on worldly standards, I was spiritually bankrupt as bankrupt as a person could be. And I began taking on a lot of big challenging things in my life and was trying to juggle too much and was trying to do it in the the arm of the flesh. 
and things just started to break down. I didn't have the power to keep up with it all. Um, started developing anxiety, a um, little bit of panic disorder. Um, you know, fear was coming was coming into my life, and it was kind of starting to spin out of control in many different ways. And that kind of led to my come to Jesus meeting, which was. It was not a eureka moment for me. You know, there was no lightning bolt. My hair didn't stand on the back of my head. But after a weekend of, of running and gunning um, with a pretty fast and loose crowd, for whatever reason, that Sunday, um, I think it was just an, uh, a culmination of everything. But I became overwhelmed with grief. I became, I was, I was alone at that time. And I became overwhelmed with grief. And, you know, I was taught, my dad was a pretty tough guy and we didn't show our emotions, we didn't cry, we didn't say I love you or anything like that. But for whatever reason, that one tear started to flow. And when it did, you know, here came the Jordan River. And um, I found myself alone in my house and just really, truly broken in my spirit. And uh, the only thing I could think to do was to pray. And so I did exactly what my mom taught me when I was a little boy. I got on my hands and knees and started reciting the Our Father. And I, I prayed to a God that I didn't believe in at that time. But it was truly that step of faith. And uh, like the scripture says, um, pride before the fall. And I think God had let me go far enough into the quicksand on my own. And uh, he let me go into the refiner's fire. And he just kept cranking up the heat. And eventually it broke me. I have big shoulders. In medical school, they teach you to be, you know, strong and independent. You don't need anybody, and you're the master of your own world. And so I had big shoulders, and as a consequence of that, I had to go really deep into quicksand and get it right up to the nose line before I kind of broke. And then uh, I prayed, I cried, and when I got up from that experience, like I said, there was no, it wasn't a mystical experience, um, but I definitely felt lighter. You know, I felt freed of, of some of those emotions. And, and the next day I decided to uh, start reading a Bible. My mom had given me a Bible from 20 years before. It had an inch of dust on it. And I dusted it off and started reading it. I, I began reading it with skepticism because I didn't really believe it was true. But I had an open heart at that point. And so um, the Lord began to kind of open up the scriptures. And I became really fascinated with Bible prophecy started looking at all these prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, you know. And as I began looking at each of these prophecies, going all the way back to Genesis and all through the, the you know, the Old Testament prophets and the Psalms and everything, it slowly started to become more and more real. And I, I remember there coming a moment in time where it became self-authenticating to me. And that was kind of a scary moment when it kind of went from this intellectual idea that maybe God was real to this reality that he is real. As Solomon said, uh, you know, the beginning of uh, knowledge and wisdom is fear of the Lord. Well, right. when you had lived the way I had lived for the last 20 years, right. um, there was that moment of fear. But, you know, fortunately, as you guys both understand, we have a God of grace and mercy. And so I began my, my new journey of uh, trying to seek out and follow the Lord ever since that day, and that was about maybe 2010, 2011, somewhere in there, so about 10 to 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's been a, a quite an interesting journey since then. Right. He, he, he's, the Lord has pulled a lot of fast moves on me and relocated <laughs> and done a lot of different things, but it's all been, it, it, it's been the, the greatest thing in the world. And uh, you know, there's there's nothing on this planet that would make me go back and step back into the, those old shoes. So as you were, um, you know, I heard you talk about getting involved in, in different things. You had a lot of things going on, juggling a lot of this here and there mm -hmm. uh, until the point where, you know, you, you, you finally felt that you were broken. Yeah. But do you think that the reason you took those things on, you were trying to fill some type of void and, sure. and something that was you knew was yeah, missing yep. or maybe you didn't know it was missing but you felt the weight of yep. it you know not being there and yeah so. I think when you don't know who you are internally when you who you are in Christ you're going to go for the exterior so the way you look the way you dress what you have not that there's necessarily anything wrong with those different things but 
Yeah, you're focusing on the outside. Um, you're focusing on money. I think a lot of people, including myself, fill that void with you know alcohol. There were many years where that was probably my number one crutch: alcohol, nicotine, all the different things that come along with that, and um, you know spending money. Um, a lot of uh, you know, I, I, it had been ingrained in me that that marriage was sort of this. Um, contractual obligation that was, uh, you know, why on earth would anybody want to get married? That was the seeds that were sown into me at an early age. And so I was very averse to getting married. And anytime I got close with a woman, that relationship would run to a certain point. And when I began to feel it reaching a certain level, there was always this immediate need to sever that relationship and move on. Of course, I didn't have the biblical understanding of becoming one spirit and one flesh with someone, meeting your soulmate and having that really amazing Holy Spirit driven soul tie that drives you together where you fulfill each other, which is what I have now in my wife, who's a, an amazing woman, an amazing believer, and who has just, you know, many times when I was on the verge of sinking, she was there to, you know, lift me up. But, um, but I totally agree with you. Absolutely. So. Very good. So you're in Burnett now. How did you come to be here? Well, after I came to the Lord and really started pursuing Christ. Um, I felt in my spirit that the world I had created in Beaumont, Texas, which is where I was living, was a very false world. All of it was just very false. And, um, and what I had built and created was like fool's gold. And I told my wife, I don't think I can keep it all. And I don't think I can stay here. It's just, I just don't want it. She was from there. She was reluctant to leave, but, um, I was able to convince her that there, you know, that there could be other places, and of course, you know, I'm not a native Texan, but my wife is, and so one of the agreements is we're not leaving Texas, because yeah. you know that should be you, the attitude of, of y'all, anybody. Y'all yeah. are pretty, pretty faithful <laughs> and loyal to to your state, and so we made the agreement to uh, strike out and look around, and we had a friend who was in this area, and we came and looked at it, and it was just so beautiful up in the hill country. I was tired of the flat land and the, uh, the mosquitoes and the humidity and, and everything on the coast and so um, we decided to launch up here and at that point in my walk um, I was just really on fire for the Lord I was reading scripture and listening to sermons and I just couldn't get enough you know it was like trying to drink water from a firing hose and it was a vertical learning curve and uh, I just, at that time, I could feel in my spirit that, that God wanted me to leave, you know? And, and I recognized it at that point early in my walk that I, I can't be making these big decisions on my own now, you know? I don't know the future. Um, I need the Lord to, to, to guide my steps. And so I felt him calling me out, but I also felt him saying that it was gonna have to come with a heavy price. And that's exactly what it did because even though I had that big, lush house and I had the cars and a lot of the the bank account and the retirement and all that it was uh that was I had made that my idol so I was I was in idolatry at that point and you know Lord's not going to let you hang on to your idols right so he you know he made it clear and not audibly of course but in so many uncertain terms that there would there would be a price I didn't realize how big the price would be the price was all of it. Um, I left shortly after the 2008 housing crash. Um, I moved down here. I rented a really cute little two bedroom condo for me and my wife uh, in the area. And we had our first one year old child at that point. And um, I was paying uh, that rent and had all of the bills of life here. And that house wouldn't sell for two years. And it had a $3,000 a month mortgage with a lot of other extras. And so all of the wealth that I had put away very quickly from month to month began to deplete, deplete, deplete. And that was a very um, surreal phase of time. You spend a decade in a city accumulating wealth and working your guts out and doing you know, rounds on the weekends and all of this culmination of trying to put something away. Things that become rusty and, and moth-eaten, should I mention. Right. And then, you know, and then in 18 months, you watch it all dematerialize, including things like at one point having to come to my wife and say, that car that costs $750 a month has to go because we don't have the money. Right. And so systematically, each of those things had to be put on the altar of sacrifice and burned up. 
and um, and it was very painful. But it it took that level of um, decapitating that idolatry to really break the spirit of greed for me, and uh, and the Lord did it um, because. We, you know, after I cleaned out the entire 401k and took the penalty on it, cleaned out the bank account, and even began to step into a little bit of debt, was the time that he then um, delivered me with a job and the circumstances that could begin then bringing uh, financial freedom again, but this time in a balanced way where your priorities are very straight and that that's never going to be placed above the Lord again. And, and so when I stepped into this new situation, I had seven years, seven good years where I could begin to save, I could begin to pour into ministries, I could begin to tithe, I could begin to help my parents who were very ill at the time and needed, you know, at least $100,000, which is a lot of money, obviously. And I was able to, you know, the Lord was finally using me to be fruitful at that point in my life, but he was also filling me in a way where I could provide for my family and we had a second child. And then, um, and then, you know, after seven years, for whatever reason, and, and I, I know from having spent enough time in, in prayer, it wasn't because of idolatry or because of the spirit of greed, but for other reasons, I had to enter into another season of, of having all that removed. And so this is the second time now in the last 15, 20 years where that accumulation process, which wasn't nearly as great as it was before, because I, I'm not in the place of trying to store everything and hoard it for myself. But um, this last year, I've had to walk through that same experience of, of letting all that go. And, and I have, it's amazing in 2022 how fast you can crush a savings account and a 401k. But leave it to me. I've managed <laughs> to do it. Yeah. So, and, uh, so but, beginning in the, so, so you were in a, a spot where um, you had to, uh, you had to be broken and um and and come to your faith that's right and for, so for now me it was during through hardship right it doesn't have to be that way for everybody and well the lord works different. through circumstances yeah. and so so then there there came a time when all right now we're we're walking by faith but our decisions are costing us yeah. everything yeah. now it's it's in, in order to put us in a place where we can do right but still, experiencing that loss is is certainly going to be difficult for any reason. Yep. And then, uh, you know, you you talk about beginning to to build again and having those seven good fruitful years, and then essentially losing it all again. Right. Losing but but now the, you have a, a foundation. Yeah, I've looked at that a lot, and I've thought about that a lot. I've prayed about it a lot, and it's like what I walked through before was in preparation for now, and. Um, the reason it had to be removed from me before is because of my own personal greed and idolatry and the things that I had allowed in. And the reason it had to be moved from me now is because of more of like a persecution and me having to make a decision on you can't serve two masters. And I was being put in a compromised situation where I was either going to greatly compromise my conscience and do things that I knew in my spirit I couldn't do or lose everything. And those were the two scales. Yeah. And I, you know, was, was just praying heavily in advance for wisdom and guidance and trusting that, you know, lean on it, not on your own understanding, but trust me in all your ways and I'll make your path known. And the Lord made it known to me that for different reasons this time, these things needed to be put back on the altar and you need to light it up and let it go. So can you go into that a little bit? Just kind of the, you know, yeah. how you got into that position and, and uh, yeah. you know. You know it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated story and it's a very controversial story. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, the, the pandemic came and um, obviously we were all greatly impacted by it. Um, there's a there's a part of me that saw it coming before it came um, being in the medical field and just walking through some of the things that I walked through I felt like the Holy Spirit had given me some a little bit of foreknowledge that it was coming and so I was looking at it through a different lens than a lot of people who maybe were taken by it very quickly and obviously the medical culture began to radically change very quickly and we've never seen that kind of radical change so abruptly We've also never seen the government try to come in and sort of do a hostile takeover where they're going to, the politicians are going to make decisions about health care. And so um, I was placed in a situation where I was going to have to make decisions based on um, 
what was currently going on in the medical community. And if I, if I didn't agree to participate, then, you know, I was threatened with my, my job and my health care and, and everything like that. And so, you know, it wasn't easy because I'm, I'm not getting any younger. You know, I'm 48 years old. My wife was seven months pregnant at the time with our third child. And um, finally it came down to the wire. And uh, the decision was, um, you know, you abide by the different rules and regulations that we are now dictating everybody must do in order to stay within the medical paradigm or you're gone. It's just very black and white. Um, there are no exemptions. There are no, are no excuses. Mm -hmm. And y it doesn't matter. You could try to uh, come and retaliate with science, with facts, you name it. And it's just this, you know, mum's the ear, we're not going to listen. And so eventually I, you know, it was, it was a difficult decision to do, but I finally told my wife and she agreed with me that, you know, we're not going to abide by uh, the, the governmental rules and regulations that they want us to do. And so we laid it down and and I, you know, went and got the U-Haul, drove it to my office, and everybody, all the doctors and nurses and medical assistants watched me pack it, and I pulled out, not having any idea where I was going to go, when I was going to go, and... Um, so when that happened, which we got, we got a whole lot to dive into right here, right? <laughs> but when that happened, did you have any support from anybody? Did anybody... You, you were Lone Ranger in this thing? Um, you know, there, there was maybe, maybe on one hand... Uh, a handful of support. I mean, a lot of people said we respect your decision. It's your life. You got to do what you got to do. And so, if you feel like this is the direction you're going, most people who know me know that. Um, you know, I dance to my own beat, mm -hmm. and 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 so it, I don't, it wasn't terribly surprising to a lot of people. Um, you know, but it was more or less. You know, it was a it was a very independent thing that I did on my own. I didn't have uh, any cheerleaders behind me right. you know, cheering me on. And, you or, know, or anybody that left with you. There was one other person that did who um, they counted the cost and decided to make the jump with me, but their circumstances were quite a bit different, no fault of their own. Their circumstances were a lot better than mine. Um, they had a lot of things laid out for them that would make an easy transition right. to just keep on going. Right. Um, but and good for them. Right. right. And they and they were also a very faithful believer. Right. So so back to this. And anybody that's listening probably understands more or less what we're talking about in this circumstance. Um, but like I said, we, we don't want to get into the you know what we should and what we shouldn't do with with in regards to the pandemic and medical care and whatnot. Yeah. But one of the the greatest things that I've noticed is. And this is coming from somebody that spends a great deal of time uh, in the doctor's office and in the hospital and having to deal with stuff. And um, are you know, we're like I was saying earlier, we're, we're pretty sickly bunch, so we're there a lot. Um, but what I can say from my perspective, at least, is that it was very easy to watch the past couple of years and watch some of these things as they took place. And and some, you know, in the beginning, nobody knows anything what's going sure. on as far as validity and and mm -hmm. you know what the government's saying and what the doctors are saying but at the end of this thing kind of coming out of it the the evidence is quite clear i think yeah i agree if anybody looks if, it, if even if you go to governmental sites you'll be able to get most of that information and make a good decision for yourself about absolutely how you should handle your medical care but what was incredibly disturbing for me is that there used to always be a, you know kind of a relationship you know we talked about relationships with doctors we don't have close relationships with doctors anymore right. or at least I don't think so um, but even in this circumstance the doctor always reserved the right to treat the the patient appropriately sure. or or to the best of their knowledge and will absolutely because you guys take an oath for that right yeah. it's like a police officer takes an oath yep. or a judge takes an oath right but it became very clear to me on the outside even looking in to see that this is not the case whatsoever yeah, and I agree. Uh, this became a uh, decisions were made based on fear decisions mm -hmm. were made yeah. made on financial reasons right. and uh, i would say even probably government funded situations mm -hmm. where it became like i said very obvious even to a lay person that decisions are being made because money's changing hands yeah. or because uh, a political entity wants things to go a certain way and 
and I'm, I'm sure I'm not just speaking for myself, but there, there is no trust, as far as I can see, between most of the public and the medical community at this point. Yeah, I agree. I think that the last two years have been a really black eye for the medical community, and it's going to take a long time to regain right. the trust. Um, you know, it was, it was an opportunity for me to, again, just try to seek God's counsel. I, I, I knew I couldn't make a decision of this magnitude by myself. I had a habit of getting up a little early and coming over to the, the Burnett Park and parking, watching the sun come up, watching the ducks on the pond. Some days you read scripture, some days you listen to music, some days you just pray. But um, the fear was coming in. And I began being fearful about what am I going to do? I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my health care. And you start playing through all those things. And I just kept hearing, you know, the Holy Spirit say 2 Timothy 1, which I've had to make a life first because remember before I was suffering from panic attacks and anxiety disorder before. The spirit of fear is very powerful. God said, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And so... Um, you know, I, I can almost guarantee that if your decision making is being driven by fear somewhere down the line, there's going to be a ripple effect to that decision that's not going to play out the way you think or the way that you want. Right. And so once I was able to deal with that uh, and realize that, you know, um, that helped a lot. That helped me walk through that decision. And so, um, and uh, you know, now um, I have no regrets in that decision. It's cost a lot by worldly standards, but at the same time, um, the Lord blessed me with a beautiful son, a very healthy, happy little baby boy, and uh, my family are thriving and doing well, and, you know, it took some many months of sort of figuring out what I was going to do, and then the right opportunities were opened up, and I was able to move forward and kind of begin to reestablish myself and, and, and be able to redo everything under my own terms on how I want to practice. Uh, as opposed to being under a paradigm where you have to walk through a very narrow narrow corridor. Right. Um, and so that's been really great, and that's basically what I'm currently doing. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. You know, you, you were faced with a difficult situation that called for you to either conform or stand on your convictions and, right. and standards, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, you, you, you felt were... Um, biblical and led of the Lord and so uh, like the three Hebrew children you said I'm I'm not gonna bow right and uh, so but it's turned out for you it's turn, turned turned out well for you it has and um, you know I, Jesus says my sheep hear my voice and they will not follow the voice of another and that really rang true to me when there were so many voices telling me you need to go this way you have to right you don't have a choice and I was like well I technically do. There's just a, you know, how much am I willing to lay down? And I just really felt like it was the voice of another who was calling me down that path. And so once I kind of gleaned and discerned that in my own spirit, there was no looking back after that. It was just now about trying to calibrate how you're going to deal with these decisions that you make because they're going to affect your wife, your children, your family, right. and people within your sphere of influence. But, um, but again, just like we see time and time in the scripture, you know, the Lord will let you go in the lion's den, but he's always there to deliver you. Um, he'll let Joseph go into prison, and you're right in the middle of his will in that what appears to be a bad situation. Sure. But he's there to deliver you, and that, that's what he has done for me. Um, without any reservation, I can say exactly, you know, that I'm where I need to be right now. I still got my own problems. I still got my own sins that I'm dealing with. I still got my own walk that is a struggle. But um, as far as this decision, um, you know, there's there's zero regret there. And, uh, and, and God is, you know, he says I'll make your path known or I'll make it straight. He doesn't say I'll make it easy. It has not been an easy path by any means. And there are those days, you know, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you sometimes question things, but then you know, he always restores that, and um, and so it's just back to one day at a time. Right. Well, I think that's um, that's a powerful point to make is that it's it's not easy. There yeah. there are things that are going to come. We we are counterintuitive to the way the world works, yeah. and just like you mentioned, being a medical doctor, that's that whole um, you know 
group, I, I guess, lack of better words, that whole group is, is running counter to yeah. Christian value anyway, right? Yeah. Because for the most part, those those guys are based off. You know, I, well, I'm not going to put words to say they're based off this or that, but it, but they, it's not a prevalent thought to be a Christian and be right. be a ranking doctor in right. a in a facility. Um, it I think breeds that, a very atheistic mindset. Right. Just the whole process from medical school to residency and on, it, it kind of it, it's easy to walk in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a very faith based right. uh, situation, but which is funny because atheism in, in its own right is is a form of religion. It is because the reality of it is is you know the person may say to you, "Well, prove to me there's a God," and maybe you say, "Well, I, I can't prove it. Prove to me there is no God," mm -hmm. and they can't prove it either but they're willing to step out in faith that there is no God. And so many of them don't even realize that they're participating in a religion that requires faith. Right. And every religion has a spirit attached to it. And that's, as the scripture says, is the spirit of Antichrist, which is there to blind the eyes of unbelievers so that they cannot see the truth of the gospel. So, but um, yeah, the medical field is kind of geared for that. But, but you know, the Lord's still working in the medical field. Either way, he does. That's correct. Thank God. <laughs> that is correct. But it's a very Still decisive needed. time now yeah. that we live in. Right. Right. So it's, it makes practicing difficult to navigate because I was part of a large organization where I was insulated from the world, and um, you know, if there was another lockdown or if there was layoffs or something, you were still being taken care of. Now I've gotten to my little buoy and I pushed away from the mothership right. and I'm out there with my solo paddle right. not making a lot of you know super heavy progress and there are still big waves coming in and you just have to trust the process at this point and know that God's got you right where he, he wants you and uh, you know he's going to take you into deep waters and uh, you just try to walk that out in faith and, and nobody knows what lies ahead you yeah. know. Well, regardless of your, your spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs or, or any of that stuff, you've got a satisfied customer right yeah. here. Yeah, and for sure. I appreciate that. At the end of the day, if I'm looking for a doctor, what am I looking I'm looking for somebody that will take the time to listen. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for somebody that will put the effort into fixing the problem yep. and will keep our interests first and what's best for us, right? Absolutely. And if that's what you're doing, which which I think that's what you do, um, then you couldn't ask for more. It doesn't matter what side of the, yeah. the religious coin you're on. Absolutely, yeah. You want somebody that's gonna take care of your problem and care about you, and that's not something you see, I, I don't think you I see agree. really uh, from a clinic perspective that much. I have lots of close friends who are not much in the way of believers, and they, they love people and they take good care of them. You right. know? Um, I think the most important thing when you're seeking a doctor in today's world is you really need to spend just enough time with them to glean their motives. What is their motivation for coming in that day? Is it to see as many patients as they can because right. it's all financial? Right. Is it they want to beat their chest in pride and schedule as many big procedures as they can? You know, what is their motivation? Right. And if you can glean in their motivation that they have a genuine, authentic interest in seeing you do better, then you might be in the right place. Right. Anything short of that, they will get you in trouble very fast. Uh, the medical field can get you in trouble very fast nowadays. Hmm. And um, so I think you have, to, you have to be very, very cautious when you're right. seeking health care. Right. No, I, I, I think that's that's spot on. I got one little story, and then I'll, I'll move on. Um, you know, I had cause to see a cardiologist recently, and um, went and saw the cardiologist, went and put me through all these tests and whatnot. And uh, we were doing a, a, you know, an exertion test, you know, getting on the treadmill, yeah. doing a little jog thing there. And while I'm doing that, he's talking to the uh, nurse that's running that that part of the facility. And I overheard him saying about how he. Um, he, he didn't like um, something to the fact he, his wife had traveled and went to see her family, but he didn't like her family and he didn't want to hang out with her or at her family and didn't, didn't like some things about whatever was involved in their relationship. And, and I remember with all the stickies on me and everything right on the trip, I think, this guy doesn't care about his wife. He don't care about me. What, what, what am I doing here? You know, <laughs> he's, eh, this isn't for me. So I, you know, I, I moved on. I, and I found another one that I, that did spend some time and, and did, yeah. seem to have a uh, concern for what we had going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. They're out there. Um, yeah, they are. They it's are. just the, the paradigm has been sown in the medical community to really push things. It's all pharmacological driven. So, 
know, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So it's about plucking symptoms out of the air, right. putting labels on them, and then writing those scripts. And the next thing you know, and, and, and you know what? Some medicine is great, right? Right. A diabetic needs his insulin. I mean, I'm not arguing that, but um, it's, oh, it's oh, too much now, in my opinion. I mean, you know, the, the number one uh, producer last year was Pfizer, for example. I right. mean, they made billions and billions of dollars. And so um, Big Pharma definitely runs the medical machine for sure. Right. And we, I think we can all see that. We, we can. It's a matter of how much we're willing to admit it or acknowledge right. it without it interfering with our lives, right? So yeah. just just like you were saying, the the hospital or the you know the, the, the medical board or wherever you're at and they're working, they, they want things to go a certain way. Well that's that's always influenced by money, right? Yeah. So what's the bottom line? Well we gotta push so much medicine. We gotta push so much sure. this. Yep. And um, if you're creating a, a, a cure before you create a problem, there's there's always going to be a problem. Yeah. So, that's ah, good stuff. It's good, yeah. good stuff to talk about. You know, when I was trying to make this decision, I was kind of asking the Lord for an example in Scripture. And um, it hit me one night. I was reading the Gospels about uh, Pontius Pilate. You know, his wife had had a dream the night before about Jesus, and she warned him not to betray Christ. And then the day that it, it came down to the wire, it says in, you know, all the Gospels that uh, Pilate recognized that Jesus was a fair and just man and, and there was no guile to be found in him. Right. So much to the point that he had to wash his own hands of the guilt of this innocent man, which I doubt very seriously washing your hands removes the guilt, but in his right. mind it was going to get it done. But what the Lord had revealed to me, what the Holy Spirit revealed to me is Pilate wanted to stand on his laurels at the beginning. He, he, he recognized something different about Jesus, and he didn't want to betray, he didn't want to sell him down the river. And then, you know, the crowds began to come, and they began to yell and things like that, and he was even able to tolerate them. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees began to say different things, and he was even able to tolerate that. It wasn't until they threatened to tell Caesar. Yeah, right. And that his position of power was going to be compromised. That's right. And then at that moment, Pilate must have felt like he didn't really have a choice. It was him or Jesus. Right. And so self-preservation right. is what came into right. thought. And I've thought about a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my friends. I don't, you know, I don't judge anybody. If they felt like they needed to go a certain direction, you know, that's up to them, right? We all have our own life to live. I'm not here to tell people what they have to do or what they don't have to do. I believe in informed consent and you being able to have medical freedom to make your own decisions. I'm never gonna get in anybody's way and stop them from doing something or force them. But you're not gonna to come to me and put a gun to my head and tell me that I have to do it either. Right. right. And so that's what the Lord sort of illuminated to me. It was like, when your self-preservation is challenged, you know, nine out of 10 times you're gonna to fold to preserve your status, whether it be like the people told me, you can't lose your job or you can't lose your retirement, or you can't lose your health care, your wife is pregnant. And you begin to rationalize your rights. Right. I'm going to have to keep all these things. And so, you know, self-preservation is a very powerful, fleshly, carnal uh, drive right. that most people will abide by. And fortunately, he, he kind of revealed that to me, and that helped me put that in, in perspective of my position, you know? Right. So... No, that's a, that's great. That's that's great information. Um, I I think you're right. I think it is self-preservation, and I think that um, I think all these people know. I think they they know right from wrong and what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And um, if they help perpetuate something that was not good, then yeah, God bless them. They got you know. I know a lot of day. I know a lot of really well-meaning people who really believe in what they're doing. Um, uh, they refuse to look at both sides of the argument, and um, they really suffer from cognitive dissonance. You know, it's a military term where um, when outside information sort of challenges your worldview or your paradigm, you kind of have this knee-jerk uh, tendency to resist it no matter right. how many facts are flowing in. Right. And um, you know, I've heard a lot of different uh, doctors who are more of my persuasion who've started using a new term called mass formation psychosis. Sounds fancy, but it's, 
it's essentially kind of like mind control. And, and that's usually when people start to roll their eyes and go, oh, here we go. And it's like, well, right. let me remind you about World War II. You know? right. Let me remind you that Jim Jones convinced 950 people to fly to South America right. and drink cyanide poisoning. Right. You know? People can be slowly mind controlled. And when the system is designed so that you're not freely thinking, but you're a cog in a big giant wheel and you're moving along with that machine, it's easy to get sucked into something without even knowing it. Right. And I think that, that that's where we stand with a lot of it now. Um, there's just a lot of people who somehow have been blindfolded by right. it. Right, right. Which is too bad. Yeah, and it's not just in the medical, it's everywhere, yeah, right? Of course, yeah, this so is. It's, it's something to be said, you know, think for yourself. Get your, get your own yeah. information, figure it out what's going on. Don't just depend on somebody to tell you how Absolutely. and what and where and so on and so forth. And anything counterproductive to freedom and your personal freedoms is usually a big red flag. Uh, well, that's where we're at now, you know, nearing the end of 2022 is our government and the system is sort of lobbying this idea that we'll give you safety and security, but it's going to cost you your freedom. That's right. And so... If there's enough fear manifesting and people have enough fear, they'll accept that safety and security for the price of freedom. And, you know, it seems to be working, in my opinion, um, which is a very concerning detail, right? So um, it's going to be interesting to see how things go moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. So tell us what... Uh you know, you, you have your life experience to draw from and the, the situations that you've you've faced and how you've you've overcome difficulties yeah. and, and uh, stood on your faith and you're doing well now. So somebody's gonna gonna be listening to this that yeah. maybe is, is in that, you know, a similar situation sure. with that now. So uh, share some words of wisdom, some advice. Oof. What do you got for us? You know, gosh, what well, like the rest of y'all, I'm i I'm still learning on a daily basis. Um, the Lord definitely, you know, he sometimes puts us in the fire, the refiner's fire, because he's trying to burn some of the old junk out. And, and um, you know, it's just kind of like the, the Moses story. Moses is a typology and foreshadowing of Christ. He, he, he goes to deliver the Israelites, and they have to walk through that desert for a while before they get to the promised land. And, um, you know, I think a lot of John 15, you know, I am the uh, branch and you are, or I am the vine and you are the branch. And uh, um, what does it say, Jerry? I am the branch. You are, I am the vine, you are the branches. And you, you have to abide in me, yeah, essentially. Yeah, abiding, yeah. And um, it goes on to say that he prunes right. people at time, right? Right. So I've learned in my life that, that our lives are seasonal. You're not always on the mountaintop. I mean, to get to the mountain, you had to work. When you're up there and you have that beautiful view, it doesn't last forever. You've got to come down. And so God allows you to have these wonderful, fruitful years where you feel his presence and you're moving forward and things are going well, you know. And then for whatever reason, you start moving into the pruning phase. It's kind of like, um, you know, plants, right? I mean, right. They bloom, they blossom, but then we have to go out and cut them back so that next year they'll bloom more. And it finally came to me, uh, having an understanding of kind of what season you're in has been very helpful for me. Like the Lord made it very clear to me that I'm in a pruning season and you just have to accept that. Right. And sometimes you have that dark night of the soul where you don't always, you know that he'll never leave you or forsake you, but at the same time, you kind of don't necessarily feel that hand there like you want. And, you know, there's a lot of moving factors that you don't really have control over. and and the Lord made it clear to me that, you know, it's just a pruning season. This is something that you've got to walk through so that in due time we can go and do more things. And that has been, understanding that has been helpful, I think. Yeah. You, you abide in that. Right. And you walk it out. Um, so that's what I would tell somebody. Um, and wherever you're at, whatever season you're in, yeah. it's always right to do right. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. And um, I just, you know, the... I guess if my encouraging word would be you just can't take for granted about making a lot of big decisions on your own. It's true. That is just a really a fool's errand. You know, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. 
He transcends all of time. He knows the beginning from the end. If you're going to make a huge life decision, if you're a believer, even if you're a lukewarm believer, and you're going to make a huge life decision without even praying about it once or seeking God's counsel, you don't have any idea how it's going to shake out. Right. right. Um, I mean, don't be surprised if you step in quicksand. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Yeah. Stop. Seek the Lord's counsel. Pray. I remember the first time I prayed, I was as uncomfortable as could be. It was very awkward to pray. And with time, that got easier, you know. And so it's just back to the, the lessons I've learned is just try and pray and seek God's counsel for everything you do. The thing that I hear a lot from people is, is that, you know, how do I know what the Lord has for me or how I can't hear his voice or whatever? And I think people are waiting for a big neon light that steps out and is flashing, turn left, turn left. And it's usually not like that. You know, um, a lot of times it's just that that's still small voice inside and it comes from spending a little bit of time with God. And, and one of the things that I've been very guilty of is being too busy. I'm too busy to take out time yeah. and spend with right. the Lord. And again, that can get you in trouble. If you can just, I don't care, wherever you're, you know, it says in the scripture, enter into the secret place, right? That could be your prayer closet, it could be your car, it could be your house, it could be on top of a mountain. But going there and being still before the Lord for a few minutes, meditating on things and just praying and asking for guidance and wisdom, that is, uh, that's, that's worth its weight in gold. So if you're in a jam right now, and you're, you're biting your nails and trying to figure out how you're going to get out of it, I can promise you with a certainty that you're going to get out of it infinitely better if you sink, sink the wisdom and counsel of God as opposed to trying to rely on the arm of your own flesh. That I can be sure of. Well, that's, that's good yeah. stuff. So um, so you're practicing in Marble Falls. Practicing How can people get a hold of you if they're, they're seeking well, your services? It only took me six months to get Google shored up. But uh, if you Google uh, Dr. David Carmack, C-A-R-M-A-C-K, I got a website and a phone number. And, um, of course, there's a lot of websites that still have my old information, and it takes a long time to shore all that up. But yeah, you can find me on Google, and I'm located in Marble Falls at 618 Broadway, which is a little yellow house next to Noon Spoon, which is a great little restaurant right in kind of the center of Marble mm -hmm. Falls. And I'm practicing sharing space there with a chiropractor, Dr. Dearmont, and things are going well. And uh, now I'm just learning the business side of running a practice, which is infinitely harder, I think, than practice in medicine, because <laughs> there's so many little pitfalls that you can sure, step into sure, there. But right. But it's, it's fun so far. It's been fun, and uh, it's a growing process. So. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Well, Doc, thanks for being here Absolutely. with us today. And thanks for having It's me. been a joy to visit with you, as always. Yeah, and we'll get you to uh, come out and have coffee with us one Wednesday yeah, morning. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> at, uh, at Unshakable Grounds. That'd be awesome. uh, yeah, so great. If you're in need of a doctor, if you need a podiatrist, or somebody to, to maybe look you over, if you're looking for somebody that cares, give this guy a call. I mean, he's... He just explained to you why you're important to him. So it doesn't matter what side of the religious coin you fall on. This no. guy is, uh, he's going to do the best by you. So so give him a call if you need him. Um, anything and else I, coming up on the agenda? Um, chili cook-off at Main cook Street Baptist, uh, October the 6th, 15th, 16th, so, somewhere in there. Is that with or without beans? <laughs> well, without beans, it's just a hot dog sauce. Hot dog sauce. <laughs> This is the stuff you put on hot dogs to make chili dogs. I'm just at, 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 chili has beans sure. in it. I know it's a big deal. You know, I've, I've, it's a battle that I faced um, my whole life uh, as long as I've been here in Texas. I said, well, chili doesn't have beans. Oh, okay. Well, chances You've are you've been wrong before. So, <laughs> well, chances are if you show up, I'm gonna make chili that's too hot for you to eat. So you can come try it. It's gonna be excellent. Yeah. That reminds me, I need to get my garlic scorpion. Mm at the house or is it in the oh it's in the i got i got it. all right <laughs> all right doctor thanks for hey, thanks for being with us my pleasure thanks, um sir. you guys have a great week thanks for uh tuning in hope you got something out of this you guys take care mm -hmm.